Hello and welcome to another episode of Cycling Insights, the podcast brought to you by La Tap Australia by Tour de France. And as many of you are well aware, unfortunately, the March edition had to be cancelled because of weather. We're going to speak with somebody from the race organisation in just a few moments. But throughout the show, Gero, we've got a lot to talk about. It's been a big weekend in Italy with Milan San Remo. And I know that is a race that you love. It's pretty dear to your heart, nine years on from when you won it. Yeah, most definitely, Matt. Um, yeah, what an eventful sort of couple of weeks we've had. Obviously, the, the first monument of the year just underway. We are both in Kayama for, for La Tap, um, which was a, you know, it was great to be there and there was so much hype about the event. So everyone was so excited about it to be unfortunately cancelled at the last moment. So very disappointing. It was disappointing. Mother Nature managed to get the better of the event. We're going to catch up with Matt Goss in our history segment, 10 years on from when he became the first Aussie to win Milan San Remo. We'll have a chat with Spratt. Spratty's back on to the starting grid. She's been doing a fair bit of racing. She had a big weekend in Italy as well. She'll give us some insights into the performance of Sarah Gigante as she rode her first World Tour race in Europe. And then in one to watch, a guy that I'm really excited about, a Queenslander riding for a Belgium team. It's Harry Sweeney who rides with the Lotto Sudal team and it's his first season in the pro ranks. Had quite a challenge just to get to Europe because of the COVID restrictions and he's about to make his debut in some of the biggest races on the calendar, races that he'll be targeting. So that's all to come on the show. But first up, let's talk to the man who was right in the thick of the action, Gero, last week in Kayama, making the decisions about do you cancel or do you go ahead? Floral Malazu from La Tap Australia. Welcome to your podcast, effectively. Happy to be with you guys. Avid listener, first time caller. Yeah, that's that's great to be with you uh, behind the mic this time, not behind my uh, headphones. So when it came to making the decision and you're looking at the forecast and you're one week out and you're seeing what the forecast is for Kayama on the day of La Tap, what's the thought process and what are you going through with your team in terms of preparing for either scenario? Yeah, so we started looking at the forecast about 10 days prior to the event, just because before that, the, uh, it's not really reliable. And it started okay. It was actually between 20 and 40 millimeters of rain, which is already a lot of rain, but the safety wasn't uh, in geo party. But basically, the process is to flag that with the team to tell them, hey, it might be wet. So um, let's be careful when we build the village and let's have a look at the race course on a daily basis as soon as we get to Kayama to make sure it's not too much impacted uh, with the rain. And obviously, the closer we got to the event, the worse the, the weather forecast was. And um, and it appeared very clear since the Wednesday prior to the event that uh, it would be very unlikely that uh, the weather would clear. So that, that's a long process to, to be in touch with all the authorities, everyone who's looking after the general public safety, to discuss with them what would what would it mean to go ahead with a with a cycling event? Obviously, on our end, it's very important to preserve the riders' safety, but we also have to consider the local community. And uh, we might having a cycling event in these conditions might stretch a lot the resources of the local authorities who are looking after the local community. So uh, we we were mindful of that as well in the decision making process. Uh, tell me, Flo. Who is the first person you have to call when you make the decision and who are you most apprehensive about calling? Who do you think is going to be the most disappointed when you decided, okay, the event is not going to happen? Well, usually the most disappointed people are the riders, but the decision making in the decision-making process, the first person I call is my CEO and I give him my recommendation. So I'm having a look at the, at the forecast and I tell him, well, it doesn't look good. I think we should consider cancelling the event. And this is what it would mean for lateral events um, and what would be the process. And then the second people I, uh, I talk to are the road authorities, Transport for New South Wales, and the police. I'm just flagging that with them. Like, guys, I think it's not safe. What do you think about it? Because these people look after the roads, so they would know exactly what heavy rains mean for the region what areas of the course um, are more prone to floodings and the police is here to look after the safety of the local community. So I have to check with them what it would, uh, what it would mean to cancel the event or what would their recommendation be. And then Flo, you stayed in Kama on the Saturday and you took a look at the course under the conditions that it would have been if the event went ahead. How bad was it? 
It was horrendous, really. Um, the the rain um, ended up coming quite late in the morning. We were expecting the rain to start around 4 or 5 a.m. And the start of the race should have been at 7 a.m. But at 7.30, it was still not raining in Kayama. Um, so I was a bit stressing, oh, it's not raining here. But I started driving the course at 8, 8 a.m. And from 8.30, it was like just torrential rain everywhere. As soon as we got inland... Um, near Berry, Kangaroo Valley, Robertson, we entered the rain and it didn't stop raining until later uh, in the day. And it was like a lot of rain. We were in the car, but even in the car, it didn't feel safe at all. We couldn't, the visibility was very poor. Um, the raindrops were like so, so big, so heavy. It was, uh, it was really, really dangerous out there. Flo, thanks for making what was a really tough decision. It was the right decision. It was in the interest of everybody's safety. And I know that all of us that were going to the event in Kayama are looking forward to getting back there in December. We'll see you at the end of the year. And thank you for coming here because actually we should mention that you and Simon spend a lot of time catching up with local kids and local students just to share the love of the Tour de France and, and inspire them to ride their bicycles. So thanks for coming. And I think uh, you made a very good impression on the local students. Simon was the king of the kids. <laughs> he was. Good to hear from Flo from Lateral Events, the people behind making La Tap by Tour de France happen. And Gero, you and I were up there in New South Wales. Without question, the right decision was made. Yeah, absolutely. We, we arrived in uh, Kayama on the, on the Thursday morning and we did a number of activation events there throughout the day uh, on Thursday just to build up a bit of excitement about, uh, about uh, La Tap. Everyone was so hyped up about it. It was, it was a really great atmosphere. Unfortunately, the weather just continued to get worse and worse, even throughout the day on Thursday, and it looked like getting worse again for the, for the weekend, uh, upcoming weekend. So tough decision, and there were so many people disappointed, but it was the right decision. But I'll tell you what, Matt, I wouldn't want it to be in Flo's shoes uh, making those kind of calls. Yeah, really difficult. Neil and I were kind of on the outside of that and seeing the stress that was put on Flo to make those decisions. He did really well in a difficult situation. Speaking of doing really well in a difficult situation, on the weekend, Italy had its biggest one-day race of the season with Milano San Remo. And then the following day, the women's race, it was the Trofeo Alfredo Binder. I'm going to talk with Amanda Spratt later on about that race. But before we get to Milan San Remo, in the Alfredo Binder race, the performance by Elisa Longo Borghini was ridiculous. Eyes flicked on with 30 kilometres to go. She was about eight seconds up the road. She had a group of five chasing her, including Mariana Voss. At less than 30 seconds was a group of about 30 with four SD Works riders. And I thought, she's burning biscuits here. She's no chance of winning. By the end, she'd won solo by a minute and 44. It was phenomenal. What a fantastic ride. And it's so good that women's cycling is getting more coverage now. Uh, and there are so many different platforms that you can actually follow the women's cycling because these girls are, are absolute racers. Like it's exciting racing and it's really good to see um, rides like that and, and different riders really lighting it up each weekend. It was a super ride. Speaking of super rides, what about Jesper Sturven to win Milan San Remo? Just diving off the front towards the back end of the race with 300 kilometres in his legs. His data for the last 2.5 Ks are almost team pursuit style data. It was a super ride. Yeah, well, yes, Mr. Irvin, you have to take your hat off to him because he had one card to play and he played it beautifully. You look at the guys that were around him in that front group and there were around 12 of them descending the, the Poggio together. And for him just to find the right moment where there was this half a second of hesitation to attack and, and get enough of a gap uh, to stay away to the, to the finish, absolutely brilliant ride. I'm so pleased for him. And then what about Caleb Ewan? You've got a feel for Caleb Ewan. When he abandoned Torino Adriatico because he was ill, I thought... There goes his Milan San Remo. How can he possibly get back from being under the weather so much that he abandons that race to then even being contention? And to survive with those guys on the climbs over the suppressor and the Poggio and be right there in the mix, it was second place. I'm sure he's a little disappointed in that, but it was a quality, quality second place. Caleb was on absolutely a cracking day at Milan San Remo. He was so impressive on the Poggio. From the, the the portions of the race that I watched, and I and I fast forwarded through, through a number of sections, but I watched the Chapressa and I watched the lead into the Poggio, and he was nowhere to be seen. He was completely out of the picture until they hit the Poggio, and he was in the top three or four positions, perfectly placed. So I thought he's in a great spot here. He can sort of drift back through the group a little bit if he has to. 
But as soon as the acceleration started across the top, he was right there with them. He mm. did not miss a beat. And I think he went over the top of the Poggio in sort of second or third position. He was beautifully placed and he was looking so good. Unfortunately for Caleb, he just needed a teammate there. He needed someone to shut down those late attacks and set up the sprint for him. Because like just a couple of years uh, earlier, he, he came a very frustrating second place behind the solo winner. Yeah, how is that for Caleb? He's finished second place behind a breakaway, but so close to winning that there was no time gap. So he's on the same time as the person that won it and he's in second position. If you could have a couple of minutes with him and give him some advice on, or what to take from that result, what would it be? Well, I think he can only take encouragement from that result in the fact that he knows it's a race that he can definitely win now. He's, he has the, the, the strength and the resilience to survive the pressure in the Poggio and he can be there. He knows he's one of the fastest guys in the world and he can survive those climbs. So it really is a, a perfect race for Caleb. He just needs the right, um, a right scenario to unfold for him. What does it tell you about his form for the rest of the season? Well, what it tells me is you know, he has really, really lifted another level in his career. And I think we're going to see bigger and better results from, from Caleb consistently from here on. To, for his first goal of the season to be Milan San Remo and for him to be going in such great form there, I think that will just give him, again, so much confidence leading into what I imagine would be his next objective at the Tour de France. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. On a different scale, Chris Froome across at the Vuelta Catalunya on the first stage, and it was a pretty lumpy stage, mind you. He was way off the pace. He was in a group at 8 minutes and 30 seconds behind. And then there was the individual time trial on the following day. That was won by Roland Dennis. Great result for Roland Dennis. We might talk about that in a moment as well. In that individual time trial, Chris Froome was 2 minutes and 5 seconds behind. He finished in 90th position. That's his worst result in the time trial since 2010. Yeah, I think everyone would so dearly love to see Chris Froome back at the highest level and really mixing it with the with the new GC stars. But the signs aren't looking good for him at this stage. I would have said a couple of years ago, Froome on a really bad day. If this is his first race of the season, he'd still be sort of around the top 20. Um, but so to finish 90th, two minutes two, over two minutes down, um, things aren't looking very good for him for, for the season ahead. So yeah, there's still a long way to go, I think, to his big objectives, but it's not looking good at this stage, that's for sure. He did make a statement that his legs were feeling blocked from coming down from the altitude training camp and that's starting to resolve itself. What's it like coming down from altitude? Well, coming down from altitude affects everybody differently. But I would have thought with a rider of, of Chris Froome's experience, he was he has done this year in, year out for so many times. He will have his preparation for any race so well refined that he would know how to come down from altitude and the sensations to expect from doing that. So whether he's using that just as a bit of a, an excuse for not performing too well there um, to take the pressure off the fact that, you know, he has dropped so much time already, I don't know. But for myself, I always struggled a little bit when I would come down from the camp back when I was racing, but I would bounce back really well about 10 days or so after that. So maybe that's what uh, Chris is going to go through uh, in a short period uh, of time from now. But um yeah, he was up at altitude with a number of his teammates who were in the front group, uh, mm. who are performing well. So again, it doesn't bode well. I still think that Israel Startup Nation are getting pretty good return on investment with Chris Froome because Chris Froome getting dropped is a story and there's still plenty of coverage for the team. But putting your rider hat back on, how does it impact, do you think, on the team when you've got the big star signing, one of the greats of the sport? There's no question. Chris Froome is one of the greats. How does it impact on the morale of the team when the star rider is effectively in the group heta? Well, it would have a massive impact from the team if the team generally weren't performing and they were going, they were looking to their big star to say, okay, now we need you to step up and win races. And if that big star is um, not capable of doing that, it does dampen the mood quite a lot. However, Israel Startup Nation, they've got a couple of wins uh, under their belt already this year. Um, they've got Mike Woods, who was performing really well early in the season too. So... They've got some some guys that are really looking for an opportunity to step up and, and be the go-to guy in that team. So I don't think morale will be too bad. Have you spoken to your old mate, Daryl Impey, at that team? I had a chat with Daryl uh, Thursday last week, actually, when they were still at altitude. And he said, yeah, we've been working hard. We've got a good little group of guys here. Um, and they were really looking forward to getting starting in the racing. So Dale's at uh, Walter Catalunya there with, with Chris, and he's building up towards the Ardennes. So he seems pretty happy there. Uh, what I, you, know, you can attest to this probably better than anybody else. He's going to be a good guy for Chris Froome to have around him. 
Daryl Impey is a very reliable teammate and just got loads of experience now. So even when Chris isn't performing there, I'm sure he'll still be there sort of by his side, encourage him, sort of encourage him just to, to stick with, with his program and to stick with his training and, and encouraging him and reassuring him that it is going to come around. So, yeah, Daryl is, Daryl is great like that from a teammate's perspective. But he also has the ability to step up and win a race as well. So if he gets to the finish in a in a Catalonia stage in a bit of a select group, uh, you can never count uh, Daryl out for for a result. No, oh, he is quick. Speaking of quick and old war horses, Mark Cavendish. He hasn't won yet, but he was second on the opening stage at Coppia Bartoli. He's moved into the leader's jersey after stage two. You can't keep Cav down for long. Well, Cav has obviously found an environment again where he's really happy and he's got a group of people around him at the Cooney Quick Step that really believe in him and they're giving him opportunities. And so I think Cav is going to draw motivation from that. But one thing that Cav draws motivation from more than anything else is when people write him off. And I think a large percentage of the population have written Cav off. And I think we could say that you and I have both fallen into that category. And he is probably drawing a lot of inspiration from that and giving him that bit of fire in the belly to, to try and get a win up again. So he's got a double dose. He's got team support and he's got doubters on the outside and Cav has got fire in his belly. I, I thought he was done, absolutely. But I would love nothing more to see Mark Cavendish win another race and to see that celebration and listen to that post-race interview. You love the underdog, don't you, Matt? You'd love to love see it. Chris Froome come back up and yep. prove everyone wrong. You'd love to see Mark Cavendish winning again. It's the romance of the sport. I love those stories. It's the boxer that gets up off the canvas. It'd be great to see Cap get a win. And I'd love Froome. I don't think Froome can challenge for the top 10 at the tour, but I'd love to see him get in a breakaway and win a mountain top finish. Yeah, wouldn't that be fantastic? And it'd, it'd be great for him. Um, you know, you could say he's in the, the swan song years of his career. So to see him go out... Uh, really fighting like that would be great. So, yeah, the beauty of cycling, it's it's uh, it's unpredictable. That every now and then the underdog will get up and prove everyone wrong, so it's great. The big classics are just around the corner. The Tour of Flanders, Paris-Roubaix maybe, Amstel Gold Race, a race that you really loved, Liège Best on Liège, a race that you won. What's the atmosphere like in teams at this point leading to the big one-day targets, particularly if you're on one of those Belgian teams or a Dutch team, someone from Northern Europe? Well, if you're on a team that are really classics focused, it's a very exciting point of the season. Everyone's sort of refining their form, um, starting to taper off a little bit into going towards their big objectives. So it is a very exciting part of the year. Um, I always really love this time of year. This is probably the period of the year that I was nearly working the hardest. I was more committed at this point in time than any other uh, any other point. Just trying to fine tune my form, making sure I was going to get the most out of my condition for the classics. So it was a it is a great time of the season. Um, I think the diehard cycling fans would love this as much as if not more than the Grand Tours in the middle of the year. So, yeah, these classic teams especially have got a lot to look forward to. I think we might have already covered this off in our rapid-fire questions in a previous episode, but I'm going to ask you this question anyway. I know where you sit with Liège and Amstel Gold Race, the races that are in the Ardennes, but Flanders and Roubaix, they weren't your thing, right? Which one would have you chosen to win if you could win just one of them? For me, Flanders... I think I, I participated in Flanders once and once only when I was Neo Pro, and that's uh, when I was with the team AG2R, and they were just throwing me in all sorts of races to see what sort of bike rider I was going to turn out to be. Flanders, I got through it. Uh, it was a, an awesome experience. I was sort of yo-yoing off the back for the last, I don't know, 60-odd kilometres, but I got to the end. Um, and just the atmosphere at Tour of Flanders is like nothing else. To be on the on the sign-on um the sign on stage there with like 30,000 spectators. It's it's absolutely incredible. The, yeah, the environment sort of Flanders really makes it a, a standout classic for me. Um, Paru Bay, I never, I never had a crack at Paru Bay. Uh, for me, that was like a whole other sport uh, that I wasn't prepared to have a go at. Um, but yeah, I think all the, the the pure classic guys, the big guys, they all they all uh, they all want to target a Roubaix. But the Belgians, they love to Flanders. It's I always find that an interesting question talking to ex pros, and when they talk about the Tour of Flanders, they don't talk about the course, they don't talk about the climbs. Whereas at Roubaix, they talk about the nature of the course. Every time you mention Flanders, they talk about the fans, and that's it. Yeah, the winner of Tour of Flanders is an absolute legend in the sport from that point on, particularly in the Flanders region region in in, in Belgium. Um, so 
the the encouragement you get off the fans, the atmosphere, everyone just sort of drinking beers on the side of the road is is really like no other race on the calendar. Fantastic. Well, the classics are just around the corner. They'll all be on SBS, and I'm looking forward to calling them. And I hope that I get to call Paru Bay. Fingers crossed that that goes ahead with the COVID situation at the moment in there. Cycling Insights is brought to you by La Tap Australia by Tour de France. La Tap Australia is the only Tour de France event in Australia and provides riders of all levels with the thrill of riding on fully closed roads, just like at the Tour. I've been part of the event since 2016, and it's always a highlight of my season, perhaps just after the Tour itself. Join me in Kiama, along with plenty of others, hopefully up there riding in December. Unfortunately, the March edition was cancelled for real Tour de France atmosphere. For more information, visit letapaustralia.com. It's L-E-T-A-P-E australia.com. Garrett, it's now time for our chat with Spratt. And Spratty has got her season underway and she's just finished a big weekend in Italy and she's about to head up to Belgium. Here she is. Well, Spratty, finally, we can actually talk about some racing. But before we get into that, what's your relationship like with Mother Nature and making sure you're always at La Tap? Yeah, I thought I would say quite good. I think it's it's been a been a sign. I think uh, well, firstly December had to be postponed, Latap Australia, and, and now Mother Nature has stepped in and said nope, this this um Latap Australia cannot happen without me there. So I think yeah, I mean it's it's a sign. So uh, looks like December it will be, and and I will be there. <laughs> the weather was amazing, and I know your parents were watching it pretty closely. Were they on their way down? Was your brother going to do it? The family going down? Your mum and dad going to be there anyway? Yeah, yeah. So my brother had planned to do the event. Um, yeah, mum and dad were coming down. My dad was not going to do it this year. He had an accident um, a little while ago, so he wasn't going to ride it. But yeah, they were going to come down and just support the event and be there. And yeah, they've been there also every every year. So they were certainly looking forward to it. And yeah, I spoke to my mum when the announcement was made on, I think, on Thursday afternoon. Mm. And mum was saying, yeah, on the weekend, she's never prayed so hard for hard rain, just to, you know, just that it did eventuate. And yeah, I mean, I've seen that some of the footage taken from the course. And yeah, I mean, I'm just great, so grateful that the, the, the decision was made with the safety and health of everyone. Yeah. Mm. At, you know, front of mind rather than any other motive. Yeah. yeah, it's a really tough decision to make because they all the people that work on it, as you know, they put their heart and soul into it and they understand the disappointment from people that are going to participate. And I actually saw a few people. I went there on the Thursday with Simon Gerrans. There was a few people that made the trip down from Brisbane. These three guys now out riding in the pouring rain and the organisers understand that they're disappointing people but they've absolutely made the right decision. For, yeah. for you, you'll be back there in December the Sprat Cup will be on, so I'm looking forward to that. But more importantly, <laughs> racing is back on for you. How was the weekend in Italy with the Alfredo Binder race? It was a big race, and the form looked pretty good for you. Yeah, so we had Trofeo Binder on Sunday, so sort of the, yeah, I guess almost like a home race for us. Um, yeah, our service course is right there. I've spent years and years training and living on those roads and in that area, so it's always sort of a, a big race for us. Um, really hard race. I think in general this year, it's an Olympic year. The level's really risen. Um, I think also just having so many riders across different teams, the the racing level and the aggressive. I mean, I think women's cycling was already exciting and now it's sort of gone next level with how aggressive it is. So I think we saw a really exciting race. Um, personally, I was a bit disappointed with my own race. I think I made a few mistakes just before that sort of very finals. So I've debriefed that with my coach, Jean, and sort of picked out where I need to be better next time. Um, I think, yeah, Lisa Longo Borghini, she was, yeah, I mean, Italian champ on Italian on Italian roads was on a mission and I think she was on an absolute other level. But, um, mm. yeah, I'm disappointed I was not in that group of five behind because I think, yeah, that's that's where I should have been. In hindsight, though, even looking at it in hindsight, I thought you were in an okay position. So I watched the last 30 kilometres, and as I switched it on, Elisa Longo Borghini was on her own. She had about, I think it was 12 seconds on a group of five that included Mariana Voss. Then you were in a group, what did you have, about 30 riders? Four yeah, from in the SD end, Works? I think, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, in that in that position, I do admit that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking game over, race over at that point. I mean, I had four SD Works and... Everyone's seen, seconds. I think, so far. Yeah, they've they've run won six races this season with six, yeah. six different riders. So I mean, you're yeah. thinking, okay, it's not not too bad, but yeah. All so of a I actually, at that time, 
<laughs> well, at that time, I thought Longo Borghini had made a silly move and was wasting energy. And then by the yeah. end, she wins solo by a minute and 44 and put in one of the performances, I think the performance of her career. It was just an awesome ride by her, as simple as that. Yeah, she was. And she's always, I'd say she's always a really popular winner as well. She's such a, a fair rider and such a hardworking rider. And yeah, you saw the way Trek set that up for her as well. So I think she races with a lot of a lot of passion and, and very aggressive. And I think, yeah, that's a style that I personally admire a lot. So yeah, I think she was a popular winner. Big weekend for Trek Segafredo in Italy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pretty good performance. <laughs> From an Australian perspective, I, or even just personally for me, I was really interested to see how Sarah Gigante went, her first really big race in Europe. You're in the group with her. How did she look within the peloton? Yeah, I was impressed with Sarah. I think she had a really good race, and I think yeah, it was always a question how she'd cope in the in the bigger bunches and also the speed. And I think yeah, I didn't see her a lot in, in the very first sections, but as soon as you know we got to the final circuits and we had the climbing, then you know she was there and she was part of the race and and very strong. And I think yeah, it's probably a really great race actually to start you know your first world tour race if you could pick one this is a really good one I think it's it's not really the hecticness of a Dutch or a Belgian sort of classic or an Ardennes classic I think it's a nice one to start with and she certainly was yeah very impressive. Speaking of which that's where you head to next what's on the agenda next for you? Yep so I'm going to be back on the cobbles shortly uh in yeah and Flanders will be my next race so I'll be there to support uh Grace and and Sarah Roy hopefully for a big result there and then after that, uh, everything's focused towards the Ardennes Classic. So I still feel like it's just forms building and building now for that sort of big week, and that's where I really want to hit my peak. And if you could win one race in April, which one would it be? Yeah, Liège, Baston Liège is my yeah my dream race to win. Yeah, I would retire a very happy person if I could win that race. <laughs> well, win it and don't retire. Keep going, win more stuff. <laughs> I can do that too. That okay. would also be awesome. fine. <laughs> I, I'm sick of talking about it, right? I have got... COVID fatigue, but it is raising its head once again. And back here in Australia, we keep hearing the reports about positive spiking, some towns going into lockdown. What's the vibe like on the ground? Yeah, we yeah, everyone's sort of talking about that third wave now. And I think, yeah, I was just in Italy on the weekend and where we were, it was actually a lockdown. And yeah, I know people could not get across the border. Um, yeah, my partner tried to come down and watch the race and wasn't allowed to cross into, into Italy. So, you know, it is getting a lot a lot stricter now. Um, so far, I think most of the races are actually managing to do quite a good job of, you know, keeping the bubble and keeping the race relatively safe. And certainly I think in Belgium, um, they've been doing it. The Flanders Classics have done a great job there. Despite the rising numbers and the lockdowns, they've done a really good job. I think, yeah, I just think the Belgian people love cycling so much that they're willing to stay at home and watch it if it's still going to happen. So probably drink beers and get drunk at home rather than on the side of the road. So that's been good. But I think the biggest sort of worry at the moment with yeah the, the lockdowns and the rising numbers aside from the obvious, from a racing perspective, are just the rumours around Paris-Roubaix um, and whether that will happen or not mm. happen. And so I think, you know, a lot of nervous people in the bunch waiting to hear what the outcome of what, yeah, what, what that's going to be. But um, is, there, is there much conversation yeah. about it within the peloton? Yeah, there is conversation. And, and I guess at the moment there's just been, you know, murmurs here and there or you, you read what a politician says and then an article, I saw an article on Cycling News, I think, talking about that. So it's more just wondering, yeah, what's going to happen. And, yeah, it's even a little bit tricky, getting trickier now with travel as well. I know, yeah, you know, coming back from certain countries, you need to quarantine. So sometimes it's navigating what country do you fly out of and what do you fly back into and does this country have an exemption for athletes or not? Or like I know when we fly into Belgium, technically we should quarantine, but because we're a cyclist, cyclists don't need to to quarantine, so we get an exception. So I think you know oh, Belgium's wow. probably the only country that allows cyclists to to not quarantine. That's how much they love it. So Belgium yeah, it's just is sort the of world navigating. Of cycling. It really is. <laughs> yeah, really. exactly. Yeah. Well, what's the passion like on the side of the road, particularly in the Tour of Flanders? Because in in my view, that's the biggest single day of sport in Belgium. Oh, it's, it's nuts. I think it even starts like the day before norm in a normal year, they have a big grand fondo and you have, I think 15 or 20,000 people that go out and, and ride the course. So you've already got all these people, all this, this atmosphere there. And then in the race itself, it's, it's just nuts. You get onto these iconic stretches of the road, like the Eau de Quaramont or the, the Paterberg. And it's just literally like, you cannot hear yourself think, um, you know, you, you're racing through, you can smell the fritz, you can almost like smell the beer off the, you know, th yeah. these are, you know, super fans that have been there since probably nine in the morning drinking beer and we're racing through it. 
sort of two or three, the men a little bit later. So, you know, they're well and truly very merry and very happy by that point. And it's just this sort of, yeah, this buzz of energy and something that I don't think I've really experienced. I know like world championships and Olympics, you can have that sort of big crowd atmosphere, but in Mm. Belgium, it just feels like something different. And I just think that feeling of, yeah, just racing over roads that have so much history on them as well. And everyone knows it as well. You just raised a really interesting point about the women racing first and then the men. This year at the Tour of Flanders, it's the other way around. And that's no good for us in Australia because that means that the women are on late and the men are on early. But for the rest of the world, I actually think that that's a really good thing for the promotion of women's cycling in that it's not that the women are the curtain raiser and then the men as the grand finale. The men are on and then the women will be on prime time in Europe going into the six o'clock news and off the back of the men's race. I think we might see the biggest audience numbers ever for a women's race in Belgium. Yeah, I think definitely. I think, yeah. I mean, the funny thing is we we share a hotel with the, the, the men and the women. We're all together in one hotel in Belgium. And I know, yeah, the men get up and start complaining because they have to have breakfast at seven in the morning. And we say, oh, yeah, well, that's been us for years. So yeah. suck it up. <laughs> that's suck it up, buttercup. Funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think now we get sort of the last one, one and a half hours of hours shown exclusively on TV. And I think there was an article recently, I think it was Le Semin in Belgium, where yes. it was the same thing. And I think they had more viewers for the women's race than for the men's race. So I they think did. that's already already saying a lot. And that's that's pretty cool. And I think, yeah, that's exactly what we need in women's cycling is to just get more people seeing it. And it's great to see. Well, I think it's really cool. And I'm hoping to see you, because it will be on SBS, at the front, supporting Grace Brown and Sarah Roy, right in the thick of the action. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. Can't wait. <laughs> Well, Gero, I tuned in to the Trofea Alfredo Binder and I saw Amanda Spratt in a position. She was in a group with about 30 riders, four from the strongest team in cycling, SD Works, and she was 30 seconds off a sole leader. I thought she'd made the right decision tactically. Hindsight, it turns out it was the wrong call, but plenty of good things to come from that for Amanda Spratt. Yeah, it's, it's early season, and I think for Amanda, she's taken a bit of a different approach to this season, not participating in the races in Australia that that have been such a such a you know tried and tested part of her build up over the years. So to see her duking out with the best riders in the front group at an early season race, it, it shows that she's put in the hard yards and she's in a great position for this year. Let's now talk some history. Okay, Gera, you've got to set the scene here. Matt Goss, he's probably just missed the window in terms of the amount of publicity that winning Milan San Remo could get you in Australia. But he was the first Aussie to win it 10 years ago. What are your memories of Gossie winning that race? Uh, I'll never forget watching Gossie win Milan San Remo. I drew so much inspiration from from that win myself. To see a guy that I would train with uh, quite regularly, um, he was part of our, our, our friendship group. We we're both living in, in Monaco at the time. To see him win that event and to see how um, how much that meant to so many people that, that work with Gossi that have been such a big part of his career, it was a really special moment. And like I said, Gossi was a, a big insp- that win was a big inspiration of mine. It was only 12 months later. We were teammates. Um, and and he was a, he was just a, a, such a prolific winner of, of Milan three in a row. He was the underdog like you love. Um, so it was so good to see him not only get up on the race, but sort of knock over a couple of big titans of the sport at the same time. Here he is, Matt Goss. Well, Matt Goss, 10 years ago, you won Milan San Remo, the first Australian to do so, and you had a pretty impressive podium. You had some quality riders either side. What are your memories of that moment standing on the podium winning Milan San Remo? Yeah, look, well, first of all, 10 years goes pretty quick, it seems now, doesn't it? But um, <clears throat> uh, it was pretty pretty special, obviously, you know, first Aussie to win, but that was next year, another Aussie picked up, which obviously, you know, pretty well there, Simon. But um, it was pretty cool. It's it's nice to actually, you know, go back and talk about it, I guess, but the memories of being on the podium are probably a bit more vague. I've got more memories of coming across the line, and um, it was quite cool that the first person that really... I saw after the finish line was Zabel, who, you know, everyone knows is kind of the king of that race. And, <clears throat> yeah, that was one of my first real memories of winning, you know, and at Secret yeah. Games when I saw um, Eric after the finish line and um, him coming up to me and saying congratulations. So, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. But that podium there that year was, um, yeah, pretty impressive one too with the guys that was on second and third that day. Well, Gossie, I'll never forget you win at Milan San Remo because I remember we were at a mate's place, we are at Jonesy's place, 
and there was a little group of us there. We always used to get together when there was a big classic and whatnot in Monaco, and we called it a Super Sport Sunday. And we'd get together and watch it, whatever sporting event was on. And obviously, we would never miss a Milan San Remo. And I was there with a couple of close friends of ours, and I've never seen a group of grown men cry quite like it when they saw you win Milan San Remo. That win meant so much to so many people that were involved in our sort of training group, our friendship group in Monaco. Um, so it was a it was a life changing experience for so many people, mate. How did that? How did the sort of a win of that caliber really change your life and your career? Yeah, look, you know, going back to what you said about those guys, we did have a close knit bunch of guys there, and you know, I think as well as you do now, we still stay in touch with a lot of them. Um, but I guess the biggest thing that changed in my career after that point is you stop thinking that it's the big races you can win, and you start believing that now I've won them. You know, I, I think that your mindset changes going into races going forward. You know, it's not just a dream that maybe one day you can win a big race. You start believing, all right, I deserve to be at the front. I deserve to be winning these races. And, you know, I think that's what changes your confidence and the way you approach different races. And the fact that you had Cancellara and Gilbert on the podium with you, did that add to that even more? Because they're two of the greats of one-day races. Um, oh, absolutely. That's just a picture, though, isn't it? It wouldn't worry who was second and third if you go on the top step. You know, <laughs> I'd be pretty happy just to be there. But look, it does, it does, um, it does look nice when you look back at you know those guys are probably some of the most successful classics riders of our generation of racing. And um, you know, it's it's very rare that you get a picture where you put those two guys on second and third step of the podium. And I guess Gossi, you kind of fast forward a couple of years. We had you know, Milan train remos that were, you know, un- like memorable additions uh, for yourself. And then for me, the following year, the addition after that was probably an unforgettable addition of Milan train remo for all the wrong reasons. It was the coldest day I've ever been on the bike. How about you? Mate, that was horrible. It was horrendous. And I, it's still one of the stories I sh- tell people about now, like, you know, do you miss days on the bike? And, you know, my mind goes straight back to that. I'm like, no, one's like that. Absolutely not. Um, like... It was just unbelievable. I remember like you're trying to take your sunnies off because you couldn't see because they were covered in snow. But then as you took your sunnies off, the snow was hitting in the eyeballs and that was hurting just as much. So it was a no-win situation where I think after about 100 k's, I just threw my sunglasses because I didn't know what to do with them anymore. And, um, you know, it, it just went downhill from there. Like it was just, it was freezing. Like you, you weren't thinking properly. It was just a robot on the bike. Yeah, I'll never forget when they, they cancelled the race halfway through and we all got we all got on the team buses to drive over the Tokino Pass because there was just so much snow up there that we couldn't have ridden through. We got on the buses and one by one, each member of the team got in the shower and cried in pain of the hot water, like defrosting you. It was uh, it was it was something that I'll never forget. And then, funnily enough, just like goldfish, we forgot all about it. And we're back on our bikes just a, a, an hour or so later. It's absolutely crazy, you know. Imagine being somebody walking past the outside of the buses, and you're just hearing, hearing like nine, eight or nine grown men like screaming in the showers. Like, you know, it must have been, it must have been interesting to see. So, I, you know, I was saying that they took my gloves off, and the, the hot air from the bus hit him after being frozen for for two or three hours up to the Tokino. Um, it was excruciating. I was actually dry reaching, and like had a bucket there, trying not to vomit in this bucket from the pain and. I remember the other guys on the bus, they're looking at me like thinking, what's going on? What's he doing? And then as they took their gloves off, they're doing the same thing. And I'm like, see, it, it's killing me. <laughs> it, was, it was just crazy. It was the coldest, as you said, so it was the coldest day I've ever had on the bike. How hard was it to get out of the warm bus and back out into the cold to finish the race? Yeah, again, like someone just said, I think we've got a real short memory sometimes and that, that, um, that uh, passion to try and win a bike race, you know, overtakes what you've just experienced and uh, I remember hunting through the rain jack or the rain bag just thinking what have we got in here that I can put on what can we wear like everything was we'd already put everything on up to that point to try and stay warm it was two sets of gloves two sets of leg warmers and knee warmers and every jacket we had and you know, you're sitting in the rain, <laughs> look at your rain bag <clears throat> having to get out in Genoa at like still only five to six degrees in rain and think what do we put on you know what's left it's all <laughs> <We've got laughs> Their clothes out of the top of the bus, like everything we possibly could was basically taken, and you know everyone had it on. The suitcase was empty because it was all on your shoulders. Going going back to the edition that you won, let's talk about that because you're riding with HTC, which was in the English speaking world the pinup team of that generation. 
But you got to the finish line or you got to the last group, the key moment. You had no teammates with you. I think second best from your team was Bernie Eisel at about five minutes in 47th position. At what point did you think you could win the race in that company? Uh, yeah, it was – the race got split really early, so I had no teammates. So I guess in two ways that, that can either work or you if everything went well for me and I didn't punch or I didn't have any issues – then that was fine because I just got to sit back and have a free ride basically because there was no responsibility on me. But on the flip side, you know, when you when we got over the podium and we're coming back down, I also knew that having not to do any work, I guess, for the, that last 100Ks, a lot of it fell on my responsibility to try and make sure that it was a, a sprint finish. So, you know, I have no one there to help, but at that point, you know, I didn't, didn't really need it. I just had to make sure I tagged the right guys and – basically try and keep Fabian from riding off the front of the group. So when you watch a guy like Caleb Ewan get second twice, but at the same time, on the same time as the breakaway that had won it, you must have some empathy for him of trying to control that late move that gets away from the sprinter. Well, I think that's why we love this race. You know, he's been riding fantastic, but, you know, as Simon can attest to, like there's more than one ways to win the, that bike race. And that's why I think, for a race that's majority flat, except for those last, you know, 20, 30 k's, it's not really that hilly, but it's more that it's after 300 k's it gets you. But anyone can win it. You've seen the Nibali win it. You've seen pure sprinters win it. Some of them, you know, small groups win it. And that's what keeps it interesting. And it's not the first time, I don't think, that the, the breakaways won on the same time as a bunch finishing behind. Um, it's exciting. It's, it's always open. Well, it's pretty safe to say at Milan San Remo, you know, any scenario can unfold and there's never a big time gap between the winner and, and the chasing bunch, whatever it is that behind. But I always say with all the classic, but particularly a race like Milan San Remo, it's got to be a combination. It's got to be the right legs, um, the right opportunity and be at the right place at the right time for it all to come together. And for a guy like Sturvin on the weekend, that's exactly what we saw when I, I was fortunate enough to win the race. It was the same for me and it was exactly the same for Gossi. Yeah, it is. And like, okay, some of it is tactics and some of it's experience, but you only have to be behind the wrong person coming down the podio because, you you know, if something's happened over the top and you've lost a few spots, that could be race ending, you know. When I won there, I think there was a crash on my wheel, the wheel behind me, and those guys never come back. So I meant we were racing with like 12 or 13 guys really to the finish instead of 25 or 30. Um, and, you know, that could be just a bit of bad positioning. You know, you took a drink at the wrong time or... T- you know, 50 metres before the top when you should have waited till you got over the other side. But, um, and, you know, you have, even with the breaks and groups to get away, you have to have guys that are willing to work with you. You know, there's no point getting away and you come back to the bunch. So I think that's why it is exciting. And, you know, you feel for Caleb, but I think he's got a lot of chances left. And I think we'll see him, you know, another Aussie chuck their name on the, on the, on the winner's list. Fingers crossed. Would you, I hope he does. He's certainly got the legs to do so if things go right for him. Would you say that that Milan San Remo victory in 2011 is your, career-defining moment? Oh, it's definitely my biggest victory, yeah. Like, yeah. Career-defining. Um, it's one of the monuments of the sport, you know. Um, it's it's a pretty pretty exclusive little club, I guess, you know, especially with the Aussie guys that have, have won monuments and, you know, some, like, like some have won a couple of them. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, it definitely, it is a career-defining. It's the biggest victory I, that I had, absolutely. And, um you know, it's it's cool that even the following year to be in the team when we were riding together, uh, and when Simon won, like I remember one of the first things that he said when I saw you after the finish line was like, "Well, you know how it feels," and you know, it's it's a pretty cool feeling, you know, to, to be able to share that with somebody else. How was it? How was it for you to ride the following year as the defending champion and have your teammate win? You obviously put in a good ride. You were fifteenth the following year to see somebody else get that career satisfaction. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing, especially as a teammate, you know, and in, in, in a team that's only just started to, to, to pack a monument in the first three months of uh, of being around is, is pretty cool. My, my ride that day, I think we had a plan that was Simon was to follow and, and to go with the, the moves and the finish, and I stayed as close to the front of the bunch as we could. And as it worked out that year, you know, the, the, the group straight stayed away in front, and I think, I think we were racing for 14th or 15th or something, and I, I finished around that point there. Um, but that, again, it's irrelevant. You know, if you've got a teammate who wins a race like that, I'm more excited for for the person that's that's picked up the win. And Cancellara was you know, second again to another Rosie. Perfect result. I hate to see. I'm not hate to see the stats. Like, imagine the stats of how many seconds and yeah. thirds, and you know, 
wins aside, we know he's had a lot of those, but the amount of times he's been second and third, it's it's just cons- like, unbelievable, really, isn't it? I think there's a, there's some sort of a stat around his last ten monuments or twelve monuments that he rode. He never missed the podium. Really, it's unbelievable, isn't it? It's it's insane. <laughs> I got a question for you, Goss, on behalf of all. A question for you, Goss, on behalf of all commentators around the world. How did you manage to get Harley onto the start list, Matthew Harley Goss? The Spanish commentators, the French commentators, the Dutch and the Belgians—they always referred to you full name, Matthew Harley Goss. How did it happen? I reckon my mum must have filled out the paperwork for the very first time I went to a national championships in about '98, and they, they just rolled with it. I don't know how it's going to stay there. I, for the first year or two, I'm like, why, why have they done this, you know? But after a while, I'm like, well, it's gone too far to change it now, hasn't it? It's like, part of your brand. <laughs> it was. And, you know, people, you go back to races and people still say that, Matthew Harley Goss, rather than just Matt or Gossie or anything. So your dad's name's Harley, right? My dad's name's Harley, yeah. My middle name's Harley. So um, it is a family name. It's been there for generations. But, you know, I, I don't know how it ended up on everybody results sheet for at 12 years or so, it's now 12 years. Well, your mum has done well. It's managed to get your dad's name on the results sheet at Milan San Remo and he didn't even turn up. Yeah, it wasn't even there. But beautiful. <laughs> Gossie, congratulations, 10-year anniversary. One of the big wins in the history of Australian cycling. Absolutely outstanding. Well done, mate. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks, Gossie. Cheers. Garrett, at the start, you spoke about the fact that I do love the underdog. One of my favourite moments from Matt Goss was actually the under-19 Teams Pursuit title at the Australian Championships. So every state had a quality four riders. Tasmania had Matt Goss and three guys trying to keep up with him. And Matt Goss basically won the Team Pursuit on his own with three other Tasmanians sitting behind him. It was awesome. And from that moment on, I was on board the Matt Goss bandwagon. Well, Gossie, he was... I think he was the youngest rider in the world tour for a couple of seasons in a row. He was signed to to Team CSC. I'm not sure what the name of the team was at the time, but he was there and there was Stuart O'Grady in the team and there was it was the biggest team in cycling at that point in time. And he was signed basically early out of under-23s or maybe he might have done one season in under-23s. And yeah, he was signed to this team and he was literally thrown in the deep end. And not only did he survive, he prospered. It was only... Uh, a short time into his professional career, he was winning races. And, you know, I think Gossi will say himself, the, the pinnacle of his career was his win at Milan San Remo. But he was a fighter. He was really good at these tough, scrappy finishes. Yeah, he won stages in the Giro. He won stages in the Vuelta. He just missed out on the Tour. If he just got one stage victory at the Tour de France, his CV would just be rounded out perfectly, I think. Yeah, another one that, that slipped through his fingers, Gossie, was the, the World Worlds. Championships in Copenhagen. Yeah, I think he's probably relived that sprint many, many times over, but it looked like he had it so close to the line. It was Mark Cavendish who just slipped past him uh, in the dying metres of that race. But yeah, Gossie um, had some very big results, but he had some very big near misses too. Yeah, so next time we go to Launceston, let's go to Gossie's Hotel. Uh, everyone who goes to Launceston should go to Gossie's Hotel. Excellent. We're going to put some details on our social media accounts about visiting Gossie's Hotel in Launceston. Well, a guy who's at the other end of his career, Gero, is Harry Sweeney. He's in his first season in the professional peloton. He's riding with the Lotto Sordal team, and I caught up with him recently. Here he is. Well, Harry, to make it from those early years as a promising junior and down to 23s to the pro ranks. It wasn't exactly smooth, but here you are as a first-year professional. Yeah, it's definitely anything but smooth sailing, but I think it's made it all the more worthwhile now that I've actually made it and I can sort of look back on the journey that it's been to get here. How did you start? Where did it all begin for you on a bike? Uh, so originally I was a swimmer and then I got sick of swimming, so did some triathlon and then... I was doing triathlon up until when I was uh, 2014, it would have been. So up until basically last years of under 17 in cycling, I got a stress fracture in my hip. So I did a lot more riding. And then my first year as a, like as a cyclist was my first year under 19, so 2015. At what point did you think, actually, you know what? I'm pretty good at this. Um, it, it was my best leg when I was in triathlon because I wasn't a great swimmer and I had an okay run, but nothing flash. So 
I always sort of knew I was okay, but it wasn't really until I sort of did a little bit of crossover testing at the uh, Queensland Academy of Sport that I realized it could have had a bit of a future there. Was there a spark though in terms of, it's not just about being good at something, you've got to have some sort of a passion about it. Was there watching a race or a performance that you did or a group that you were training with that really inspired you? Yeah, well, funnily enough, actually, I was doing recon for the classics uh, two days ago and I was telling the DS here how when I was a triathlete, I always used to watch Rubain get some uh, butterflies in my stomach when they rolled into the velodrome. So that was sort of the first real thing that got me into it. It wasn't really watching the tour or anything because it that it doesn't really have the same vibe as the, the spring classics, you know? Well, I've seen a few pictures of you in your first year in the Pro Peloton, riding across the cobblestones, splattered in mud, looked like it was wet and cold and miserable. Is it as romantic as it looks? Funnily enough, I actually <laughs> love that sort of stuff. Like a lot of guys say say they hate it, but like it just the thought of it, it's really romanticized. But for me, like when I'm actually doing it, I'm really loving it. It's something that I enjoy and it sort of brings a bit of pleasure knowing that so many guys hate it. <laughs> I always found it curious that a guy like Robbie McEwen and now you as a Queenslander that you've ended up in Belgium teams, Lotto Sudal, and Robbie lived in Belgium his whole career and he's the king of the Sunshine Coast. Oh, sorry, the king of the Gold Coast. He just loves the 25 degrees plus you know, shorts and T-shirt all year round. Uh, yet both of you seem to have adapted to the cold weather really well. I think that's part of the reason why actually is because you get all these Belgian guys that are training the whole winter in horrible weather, whereas we're in the sunshine, we can enjoy it. And then we know that by the time the spring comes around, you're just going to be in terrible weather. So I think it's something that you learn to embrace for a a finite period of time, whereas the Europeans sort of, uh, by the time the spring comes around, they're completely over it, you know? Going back just a couple of steps before we... You know, fast forward to this year and now your first year in the pro peloton. When you were in the under 23s, there were a couple of stumbling blocks. It wasn't smooth sailing. Was there any point in your career at, you know, 19, 20 years of age where you thought, maybe I maybe I won't make it? Yeah, actually, uh, during the first lockdown when I was riding with uh, Lotto, actually, and I went back to Australia, COVID hit. It was my last year under 23. All the racing was cancelled. And I went back to Australia. I was training with uh, my mate Jordan Kirby, who's now on the New Zealand track team, and um, just sort of discussing what my life plans might be. Like, uh, I had to realistically think about what could happen if I didn't actually make it back and I didn't sign pro, you know. So, um, yeah, I, it was that sort of point where I wasn't really sure if I was going to make it or not. And I always said that. By the end of my under-23 career, I guess you could say, if I hadn't made it, I was just going to move on to do something else. But, yeah, the stars really sort of fell into place for me there. I made it back to Europe, uh, had a really good start, restart to the season, I guess, and then, yeah, the rest has sort of just worked out really well for me. And at the end of the season, you won one of the biggest one-day races you can win as an under-23, the Piccolo Lombardia. Was it at that point that you really started to believe? Did you already have a pro contract by the time you'd won that race? Yeah, so what happened with Lotto was sort of a verbal agreement that I was going to go pro after I'd done a year in the development team. Uh, And then I'd signed my contract officially, I think it was in August. So I'd already had a contract signed and then they'd announced it, I think, just after Lombardia. Yeah, right. So they waited for you to get that big result so they could say, see, we got him first. He's one of ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was really good. Go on. I was just going to say that it would have been nice to sign the contract afterwards, but, yeah, it's uh, you can't can't be unhappy about it. It might have been a bigger contract, but a bird in the hand is better than two out in the bush. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what about the Lotto Sildal team? as an Aussie. I mean, it has got a serious legacy with Australians going back to Scott Sunderland Road with the team in about 1996 or thereabouts. We've had Cadell Evans, Robbie McEwen, Adam Hansen, Hank Vogels, and now Caleb Ewan and you. It's a hell of a legacy at that team for Aussies. Yeah, for sure. It's something that uh, it runs really far back, but I think also the team really embraces the Aussie culture. Um, Everyone that you talk to on the team, they 
they all just get along really well. I think it's sort of the the almost underdog spirit or battler spirit that the Belgians have as well. So, yeah, it's just something that works out really well for me. And Or you can see the history of Australians in the team. It's just awesome. Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities between the cultures. And it is that yeah, for sure. we're the underdog, working class, we're going to get this job done. In, in terms of your off-season, tell us about your first off-season and your challenges to get back to Europe. Yeah, so since I spoke to you last, I was planning on living in Belgium. I'd have my apartment was completely set up there, ready for my first European off-season, basically. I wasn't planning on going back to Australia at all. And then uh, I got a call one day from my manager saying, oh, you're not going to be able to get a visa in Belgium. And I was there on a 90-day visa last year, just a regular tourist visa, which had five days left. So fully packed up my apartment, two days, and I was on the phone to my manager like 24-7 trying to figure out like whether I could go to Andorra or I'd go to another country. Nothing worked out. So I packed up my apartment two days, flew home, back to Australia, then two weeks in the hotel quarantine during my off-season. And then basically I had to start from scratch, figure out where I wanted to live, what visa I could even get because of COVID. And then the next challenge was trying to get down to um, to Sydney. It was to apply for the visa because the Queensland, New South Wales border was shut. So I waited and waited. And then December, I think I finally applied for this visa. And then the border opened during the two-week period I applied for it and then shut again. And then the day I was meant to fly to training camp, so the 2nd of January, I got a call from the embassy denying my visa. Uh, so that sent me into a tailspin again. And then I applied for a new category. And then five days later, they got back to me. They approved it, sent my passport back. And then three days later, was on the plane over to Spain for the last week of training camp. <laughs> So normally you're nervous about your first set of races. You got to Europe and you're a lot more relaxed because it was less stressful being in the pro peloton than trying to get organised to get over there. Yeah, well, it, it was just absolutely crazy because I'd had to look on Facebook Marketplace for an apartment in Nice because I'd never actually been there before either. So I'd agreed to this lease but hadn't signed it yet, but hadn't got my visa and the waiting period for the lease was almost up. So I had 12 hours left to sign this lease. So the whole of my off season, I'm just like on a knife edge, just like a nervous wreck. And then I finally got to training camp, unpacked everything, set up my apartment. I was like, finally can relax and just train. <laughs> so what, it is an epic story just to get there. Why did you choose Nice? Uh, well, part of the reason for me was I really liked to almost have something outside of cycling. Like obviously in Girona, you've got, so many friends like at any one moment you've probably got 20 friends that are within a kilometer but what I sort of wanted and I still haven't got yet which I need to work on a lot is a bit of longevity in an aspect that it's not just everything cycling so in Girona when you live there you only have cycling friends you only talk about cycling it's just so intense and I think I've sort of realized that I don't think I'd be able to do that for a long period of time so the whole point of moving to Nice was sort of to throw me in the deep end a little bit and realize that when you don't have all of this cycling talk that you need to have another aspect of your life so that's something that I'm trying to work on at the moment obviously lockdowns in France has made that really difficult but um, yeah that's the, the background behind it and then also having the airport so close is just unreal and the beach <laughs> Uh, and a good climate as well. Yeah, and a beach. Yeah, good climate. It. I think it's a really smart decision in terms of having that that other outlet is a really smart decision. And I think that's a really mature decision as well because if you have it, you have a bad day, you have a bad race, you have a bad tour, and that's your only circle, you beat yourself up about it. But you need to be able to move on, pick yourself up, reset, and go to the next target. Yeah, for sure. Well, it, that's uh, the background. It's actually it's been quite difficult moving into my apartment in Nice because nothing really prepared me for the fact of like moving into your apartment, you're officially a pro cyclist. And then I was just sat down like, this is my life now. Like, what do I do? So I think if I moved to Girona, I wouldn't get that. And I'd just be content, like going through the motions for 
however long it was. So now it's sort of mm. really forced me to actually think about what I want to do when I'm not on the bike. So uh, yeah, that's something that's really challenging me at the moment, but like a really good challenge. So I'm hoping to sort of build the rest of my life around a life in Nice, I guess. Based on the mature decisions that you're making now, I think your life is going to work out all right. So let's just talk about the bike for a minute. You've mentioned Paris-Roubaix, your love for the classics. What's on the program for this year for you? Uh, so tomorrow, actually, I race uh, Bruges de Pan. Um, I have that. And then a day easy, then I race uh, E3 Classic, Saxo Classic. Um, after that, I go to Kent Wevelgem. And then another few days easy, Good and race. then I raced Dwarsdorf Flandern, and then a few days easy, then Tour of Flanders, then I think four days easy, and then I do Schelder Price, and then Roubaix, and then that's the block done. So first yeah. year pro, <laughs> and you're doing Flanders and Roubaix. Pinch me. Yeah, well... <laughs> I actually, I had a, a talk, Mark Sajant's my allocated sports director here. So we get along really well. And in the off season, I told him, oh, like put down, they ask you what you want to do for your program. I was like, oh, be a bit cheeky, like maybe put down Strata and Roubaix or something. Like fingers crossed I might get it. And he called me back. He's like, yeah, we'll put you in for two monuments. You do a grand tour as well. <laughs> I was just pretty stressed out at that point, but like super excited. So yeah, like now I'm here. I've done a few one days and tomorrow's the first world tour one day race of my career. So yeah, it's uh tense times, but like, yeah, I'm really excited. Intense times, but I'm convinced you're ready. I can't wait. I'm going to get to commentate to of Flanders and also Paris-Roubaix. And I'm looking forward to calling your name, get to the front so we can give you a mention. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? I'd, um, yeah, well, it depends sort of what my role is, obviously, being a Neo Pro. Like, you'd probably see me at the front for the first half of the race positioning the rest of the leaders, and then that might be it. But, yeah, like, just to be on the start line and have the faith from the team to be doing that is just enormous. So all going well over the next few races, yeah, that's the plan, as I'll be in two monuments, which is just absolutely crazy to think about. But, yeah, it's for the moment, I'm just taking it day by day. Like, even to get selected for... Depana or something like that, or an E3 in your first Neo Pro seasons, incredible. So, yeah. I, rest assured, if we get one helicopter shot at Roubaix or Flanders, you'll get a mention in the commentary. I think it's awesome that you're there <laughs> first year. But thanks for your time. Good luck for the season ahead, and we look forward to watching the rest of your career. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks for talking. I really appreciate it. Well, that's Harry Sweeney. He certainly is one to watch. And Gero, he's making some really mature decisions early. We heard about his challenges of not being able to go to Belgium, where he was originally due to live, and then choosing not to go to Girona, which would be an easy option, surrounded by lots of other cyclists, and choosing Nice. He's on a good path. He is on a great path. And you know, I support those decisions all the way. Nice is a town that I lived in when I first turned professional, so I'm quite familiar with that area. On top of that, there is a great training group just up the road from Monaco and his big sort of team leader being Caleb Ewan living there as well. So he's going to be able to ride with Caleb, train with him, learn a lot from him. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like Harry's really on a good track. How significant do you think it is, as a guy that rides for Lotto Sudal, a big Belgium team that focuses on the classics, that he's on the list to ride Flanders and Roubaix in his first season? Well, Lotto Sudal obviously see a lot in Harry. The fact that his big result as an as an under twenty three was Lombardia, that's a very different race to Flanders and Roubaix. So he is a, he must be a very complete bike rider for them to say, okay, we can see that you performed in a in a mountainous race, but we're going to throw you into the classics, which are two of the probably most important races for the Lotto Sudal team. What I found fascinating from him as a Queenslander was talking about the fact that he loves the romance of racing in the wet, cold condition on cobblestones. Well, I think he spent uh, the last portion of his amateur career probably based up in up in Belgium. So he's going to know those roads and he's going to know those conditions and he's obviously quite comfortable in them. So, yeah, he's going to be he's going to be good in the heat coming from Queensland, but also to be confident and enjoy racing in the, in the wet, cold and on the cobbles. Um, it sounds like uh, Harry is going to be a very, very well-rounded bike rider. So everybody listening, make sure you follow the career of Harry Sweeney. 
Okay, Gero, it's time for our rapid fire questions. And I thought we had to have a weather one in there based on the weather that we had in Kayama. Let's assume it's not raining, right? What are you choosing? 40 degrees or zero degrees? Well, I live in Melbourne now, so it's pretty safe to say I could get either of those and, and potentially in the one day. But I would go 40 degrees any day of the week over riding my bike at zero degrees. I'm going zero. You? Zero. You're going zero. Absolutely. I, I love the, the storytelling of zero. To come home and post on Strava with your Garmin and that the temperature was zero degrees because if it's not wet, you can dress against that. But 40 degrees, I'm a sook. If it's 40 degrees... I feel like I'm in Madden Two Swords and I'm about to melt. I'm no good in the heat. Uh, I couldn't be more contrary. I think if I, if I look back of my uh, my performances when I was when I was racing, there was very little, you know, below sort of about 15 degrees. I was much more much more a hot weather rider, and I enjoyed race, riding in the hot weather. And and my results um, my results reflected that. Okay, now we're up in Kiama. We're going down a long descent. What do you go with, Matt? A newspaper up the jersey or do you put a wind vest on? Wind vest. I put the wind vest on if it's in a mass participation event or it's a social ride. But come a race, I'll be sticking the newspaper up and I've got in my mind the images of Jai Hindley. I can't remember the climb that he was going over the top of at the Giro last year where he nearly crashed trying to get the rain jacket on. Yeah, I think if you have the time... And, and if you're not in a big hurry, a wind vest is always a better option because rather than battle with the zipper, you can always pull over for a second on the side of the road, stop, zip up your rain vest, compose yourself and get down the other side. In a race environment, and you, so, you see it so often when you're watching the likes of the Tour de France, all the swan years are up on the side of the road and they're handing out pieces of newspaper. And what the riders do, they'll just shove that up their shirt and it just stops the cold wind from, from getting on their chest because they're, they're often very wet from sweat. It's a very quick way to have a bit of protection and then what you can do at the bottom of the hill, they just pull the newspaper out and they throw it to the side of the road because it's obviously going to disintegrate. <laughs> okay. Next up, you're heading out to the airport, taxi or Uber? For me, it's Uber these days. Yeah. Yeah. Uber, yeah, Uber just seems a little bit more, you know, there are more Ubers available than it feels like than taxis. Um, yeah, I'm more of an Uber guy. How about you? Uber, the car's normally cleaner and I can track it coming to my house. Even though some of the other taxis, they've got apps that have them tracking coming to your house. I'm on Uber every time on the way out, but you're getting a taxi on the way home because you go to the cab rank. Cool. Yeah, you go to the cab rank. Oh, at an airport, you know, when there's a lineup of cabs, I'll take a cab if it's lined up there for sure. Yeah. But if I've, if I've got a call, uh, call the ride, then it's definitely an Uber on the app. Okay, you're treating yourself, Maddie. You're having a milkshake. Are you going to go for chocolate or vanilla? Easiest decision of the day. Post-ride, I wait through my coffee when I get home. I want to fill up on calories and good flavor, 100% vanilla. Oh, what? I thought you were going to say chocolate. No, nah. sure. chocolate is the most overrated flavor on the planet. Oh, I'm a chocolate guy. I'm a chocolate guy. I'll have a chocolate milkshake any day of the week. Nothing better than going out with the kids for a hamburger and a milkshake, and it's chocolates all around. Yeah, but you'll enjoy the milk. You'll enjoy the hamburger more if you get the proper milkshake. Vanilla, vanilla, <laughs> vanilla. Yep. Uh, all right, last one. Training ride, not racing. Training ride. Gloves or not gloves? Gloves or not no gloves. gloves? Not gloves. Yeah. No gloves for me. Yeah, on a training ride. I understand all the arguments and the benefits if you do fall, the safety element of wearing gloves, but the feel of not wearing gloves, if it's not cold, I'm a no-gloves guy. Yeah, and funnily enough, I would never wear gloves training, but as soon as I got into a race environment, if I didn't have gloves on, I felt like I felt vulnerable. I yeah, felt right. like I didn't have a helmet on. Just that extra level of protection, knowing, and maybe it was a bit of a mental thing that once the gloves were on, then I was racing, you know, then you were, then you're ready to, to, to fight basically. A but yeah, without gloves, I felt vulnerable in a race, but it's interesting now. And that was, so the gloves was always one bit of advice I always received early on when I was racing, always wear gloves, always wear sun cream. And these days you see so many of the big stars of the sport racing without gloves. Vanderpoel, yeah, Heinrich Vanderpoel's Hasbro. one. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's quite a few that will race without gloves. Why do you think that is just because of the feel? Yeah, maybe that's just what they've got gotten used to. And a guy like Vanderpool, like he's he's he would have had a number of crashes over his career, very experienced rider already. Um, and you see him racing without gloves. I'll never forget one guy, probably one of the first guys that I noticed racing without gloves, was Heiner, Heinrich Hausler. 
He never raced with, that, with, with gloves on in any condition. It could have been a minus five when you have no gloves on. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's bonkers. Hard well, as nails. He is. Well, Gary, that's all we've got time for on this episode. I'm looking forward to the classics getting underway, and I'm looking forward to eventually getting back up to Kayama at the end of the year for La Tapestria by Tour de France. Thanks for listening to Cycling Insights, La Tapestria by Tour de France podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to us. Leave us a review and please recommend us to your friends. It makes a big difference to the podcast. We'll see you on the road.